Hey everybody, I'm here uh, with my friend Jeff Schneider. Hey everybody, I'm Jeff Schneider and I'm here with my friend Adam Neely. And we're here to teach you how to not suck at music. All right, we practiced that, that was good. Mm -hmm. We're here checking out your submissions. Let's check out the first submission and it comes from Google, your password has changed. Okay. That's not good. That's not good, okay. Uh, so our first submission is coming from Cooper Cook. His brother apparently has criticized it saying that it had no melody. And so we're gonna listen to it, and he's asking a question, does a song actually need a melody? Let's find out. Sounds like some cool video game boss battle music, and I'm into that. I think it's a really cool piece of music. Uh, I know one of the comments that I think your brother or your friend made was that there wasn't a melody. You know, I'm not so sure about that because what I'm what I'm hearing is a lot of repetition, and even though that repetition doesn't give off a traditional melody that you might hear as a single note line that you might be able to sing or something like that, the the repetitiveness of it does fulfill the purpose of a melody gives the listener something that they can recognize and wrap their heads around. Yeah, for sure. That piano line, that da boo doo ba boo doo ba boo ba doo that's to me kind of almost a form of melody. I mean, it's a super repetitive melody for sure, but you know, there's an ins entire style of music called minimalism that is entirely based upon this idea of something that's repeated over and over again. And because something is repeated over and over again, your ear latches onto it. This isn't a minimalist piece of music in the same style of like Steve Reich, for example, but it still kind of has that same idea behind it in terms of like melody is the repetition. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you have this music played by real musicians with real instruments as opposed to the notation software performing it, you're going to get a lot of variation just in the performance. So, you know, when we listen to it played by the computer program, there, the, the repetitiveness is is exaggerated because it's played in a very almost flat way. But as soon as you bring it to real people, there's going to be more life. And you get a taste of that actually in, um, in some of the variation in the crash symbol. I think it comes up in measure 13 where that crash symbol, symbol hits in, uh, in ways you wouldn't expect. And that's the sort of variation that's going to come just naturally when you put this in front of real musicians. I guess the one thing that you might want to change or just experiment with is layering in things at different moments. That's something called terraced dynamics. When you terrace in the entrances of different instruments to come in at different uh, I moments. I thought you said terraced dynamic. Ter you said terrace. I said terrorist. Oh, terrorist. Oh, yes. That's, okay. You know, that's okay. A different video. We're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. YouTube, we're in trouble now. So bringing in instruments at different times can definitely help alleviate the repetition sometimes, the same way as, you know, if you want to have real instruments with real people subjected to your music. I don't mean subjected to, but, you know, do I mean subjected to? That's not, I don't want to be sidetracked, Neely, come on. Uh, the best part would be if you talk like this to yourself when you're recording on your own. Uh, I don't. Neely, let's go. Neely. Steely, stop it! Stop it! The guitar voicings, they sound good with the music here, but they're, they might not, might not be the most realistic voicings for an actual guitarist, so... Yeah, I like the sound of it, and the sound of this E minor 7 here, when it actually hit, when I was first listening to it on, I guess it's the ninth bar, I really enjoyed, it's kind of almost a texture shift, but that is not particularly practical on guitar. Any sort of closed position seventh chord on the guitar ends up being rather tricky to play. Closed position major seventh chords can be doable, but a minor seventh isn't. So just check that with whatever guitar player that you end up uh, roping off the street, um, you know, delivering pizzas. Just, you know, check with them, making sure that they can actually play this E minor seven. One other thing I think is important to mention here, and this is sort of a broader topic, but if somebody says that your music doesn't have this or that, or if it's not good, you always have to take that with a grain of salt. Like, that's kind of what we're doing here, by the way. We're, you know, giving our opinion, which is just that. It's an opinion. It's the right one, by the way. <laughs> that, that's true. Um, <laughs> but keep in mind that if music sounds good to you and if you feel good about it, that's really all you need to, to know at the end of the day. That's all that really matters at the end of the day. And soliciting somebody's advice is actually something that can be very useful because you can take it with a grain of salt and understand how other people are interpreting your music, but don't feel like you need to change it just based upon 
somebody else's opinion. Just take it, understand where it's coming from, and go on from there. Take our advice very, very much with a grain of salt, too. Like a bigger grain than whoever <laughs> made that comment about the mountain. Yeah, our salt is bigger than It's like your brother's the, the rock salt. The yeah, pink we... Himalayan rock salt from Trader Joe's. <laughs> okay, so thank you for your submission. Let's check out the next one, which comes from Mitchell Thatcher. Mitchell has sent a piece of music for the piano, which uh, we're gonna listen to right now. Actually, a nice sort of breath to the the melody in, in the beginning for sure there's this melody line and then it, it pauses and then we have the next phrase and then you, you have that sort of musical grammar where you have those periods and those commas and that helps break it up which it's really it's, it's really nice towards the end things start to get a they start to like uh, go a little too meandering territory yeah I agree like towards the end and this is something that I see a lot when people are writing music and music notation software is you start breaking out with faster subdivisions because earlier on you don't have any 16th notes but by the end you got this really fast 16th note line and i think that just comes from not having a grand idea of the form of the piece of the music it's like you start simple but then you just get more complicated at the end because you're kind of just like looking for more ideas and one way of getting more ideas is just start notating 16th notes rather than anything else so i think having a better idea of that breathing, that musical grammar can really help. And unfortunately, some of this problem comes from the fact, I think, that you did this in a musical notation software. Really what it comes down to is, the way I think of it, is when you're making music, you're essentially putting out into the world what you're hearing in your ear. Now, when you, when you actually play an instrument, well, first of all, when you sing, that's sort of the, the most direct relationship between your ear and the external world, we'll, we'll call it that. Uh, when you go to an instrument, then you're creating another barrier. You're going from your ear, you're skipping your voice, you're going to a, like a piano or a guitar. Uh, then you go to a music notation program or, uh, or DAW, and then there's another sort of barrier there. So you have to watch out that you don't get too disconnected from the music in that way. One thing that you can do to help with that is by actually singing the music that you're putting into the, the notation software. That'll keep you connected to it, and then you don't have to worry so much about, okay, is this actually gonna translate well to instruments? Does it actually make sense musically? I think the, the voice can be a really good way to keep you grounded, keep you connected to what you're actually hearing in your head. I think that you said that you are, you had a beginning piano lessons, sorry, classical piano lessons for about a year, a while ago. I would suggest trying to play this on your piano. Uh, not even just, you know, because it might be fun. Hopefully it will be fun. Music's fun. Some, sometimes they tell me that. Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes it's fun. But I think it would be really fun for you to try and play this on piano. And you'll discover a lot of things about this piece just by the virtue of the fact that you're playing it on an actual instrument. You'll understand like, oh, that sounds, that sounds great and it's fun to play. Or that doesn't really feel good to play at all. Like maybe I could change that ever so slightly. And there are a lot of these little moments in here where I think that they would sound really great when you play it live on an actual piano and things that might not feel great when you're playing it actually on a, on a piano. So there's different layers of taking this piece of music and actually making music with it for yourself. Not only singing it, but also trying to play it on the instrument that it's written for. Yeah. One other thing about the 16th notes at the end and how Adam was talking about, uh, you know, throwing all the, you know, pulling out all the stops towards the end of the piece of music is, uh, you know, think about like a movie or a story or anything that has that, that sort of classical arc where you're, you're starting out small and then it kind of crescendos, but then there's, you know, a little bit of a decrescendo at the end. There's a chance to reflect on what happened, to resolve. If, you, if you're watching a movie and then all the action happens at the very end and then that's just the end of the movie and there's no sort of, um, you know, the hero bringing the elixir back to uh, back home to reference the Joseph Campbell. I'm, I'm starting to sound like you now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> with the references. Yeah. Um, the hero's journey 
journey that is. Yes. Yeah, I would suggest maybe putting those sixteenth notes like maybe five eighths the way through. Sometimes I think about the Fibonacci sequence in terms of how I organize the climax of my pieces. Five eighths is usually a good sort of way of understanding because that kind of correlates with the act three in the traditional hero's journey, uh, the mono myth, uh, all those like, you know, film theory sorts of things can still apply to music in this way. You want to have the climax at a part that makes sense. You know, these types of guides, guidelines and these rules, they're, they're good to know. They're good to write with that intention. And then once you're able to do that, once you sort of internalize that skill and that knowledge, then, you know, you can choose intentionally to not do that. If you want to end on 16th notes, fine, but, you know, be aware of how that's going to leave the listener with a, a different effect than they would be left with had those 16th notes been, you know, maybe a few eighths of the, of the way earlier. All right, so let's check out the next uh, example, which will come from uh, Yonan, Yonan, Jonan. Well, Yonan, uh, you have sent us an example of a harmonization of <clears throat> the lick. I like the title and the spelling. Yes, with two C's. That's how you know it's thick. It's a thick lick. Ooh. You think you can copyright the lick? Oh. I doubt anyone's copyright. Uh, yeah, I doubt it. Oh, man. I need to get on that. Ooh. Oh, no. I think we need to talk about something that was written in the email. Okay, yes. So he wants some uh, feedback on not only leaving chords, but reharmonization in general. So I think that these chords are cool, that they harmonize the lick quite well, but there's a couple problems with how you've voiced them, meaning what notes are actually in the piano part that you've written. For example, this E major 9 doesn't actually have an E in it, so it would be very difficult to actually call it an E major 9. Now, it sounds fine, but although, yeah, my impression, based on what he wrote in that email, was that he probably put the notes first, and right. then he put the chord symbol later. True. So maybe we shouldn't, maybe we sh what we should do is see what chords these actually are. Yeah, and the thing is, is I probably would not call this an E major 9, what would you call this? I would probably call this, well, that's kind of tricky because you've doubled the F sharp and doubling between the melody and the left hand sometimes can lead to some imbalances in the chords or sometimes it can lead to chords which don't have all of the member parts of this. I would say just because they're only, you only have the piano here, I would have to go with the root being you know, F sharp. I would actually take, uh, take offense to that, not take offense, take umbrage with that. I would disagree with you on that. Okay. Okay. I would be offended by that. And the reason for that is I think I would put the, uh, the root of this chord as a G sharp. Mm. And the reason is because typically chords are built by stacking thirds. And there are no thirds between F sharp and any of the other notes. And there is a third between G sharp and this B. And traditionally, if you're stacking thirds to build a chord, you would build G sharp, B, and then D sharp. But there is no D sharp in this chord. Well, so what if, what if it's an F sharp sus chord? That's true, but then there isn't a C sharp in there, and typically sus chords would have the fifth in there. No matter what you say it is, there's always going to be a note missing, whether it's an E major 9 or a G sharp minor 7 in third inversion, like my interpretation. I mean, ultimately, we haven't actually discussed the context, like, what's the next chord? That can sometimes inform what your chord is, based on what's happening around it. So let's, maybe we'll, we'll keep going here and we'll see what we can figure out. Yeah, so in the next chord you call an A major 7, and it doesn't have a full A major 7 in it. There is an A. There's two A's, in fact. You've doubled the melody between that A in the left hand and that A in the melody, but it doesn't spell full A, a major 7. I would still maybe call it that, because that C sharp certainly is implied of that A major 7. What would you call it? Well, if I went with my root on the bottom, let's go with that, yeah. I would say sort of like a... Maybe like a, an E sus add three or E add four. I mean, what, what, what is that even called? Yeah, and that's the problem is that you've written music which doesn't quite fit with any traditional understanding of what chords are. And that's okay because it sounds fine. You've written things which are by themselves not analyzable that easy as chords but they still might fit in with like in the general scheme of things like an A major seven. So for example, if you happen to have a C sharp in a different instrument, or if you had like an A on the very bottom by the bass player was playing an A, then you would very easily be able to call that an A major seven. Sometimes chords can lead to this trap of trying to force something into, I'm gonna use a fun, fun word, Procrustean bed. Ooh. Yeah, it's a good word. You just, you just beat my uh, hero's journey reference. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna out-reference each other. <sighs> um, a Procrustean bed is basically something that you try and force something into, even though it doesn't need to be in that. And be when you force it into that thing, that Procrustean bed, then it loses something in the process. In this case, when you try and name these chords, 
you're losing the essence of what you're doing. So the next one you have here is uh, D sharp minor at four. Well, so you have a D sharp, an F sharp, a B, and a G sharp, which on the surface is kind of hard to actually like look at and be able to like say exactly what kind of chord it is. But it actually, I would call this just a G sharp minor seven and uh, second inversion because you got that D the fifth of the chord or D sharp the fifth of the chord the fifth of the G sharp minor seven chord on the bottom So it's in second inversion. So some of these things can be a little bit tricky to try and analyze when you're just looking at it I for one kind of suck at parsing sharps I re once we get into like D sharp minors and uh, like G, G sharp, sharp yeah. yeah, all the G sharp stuff. Ugh, I don't like that. I, I think it, it tends to be flats for horns bands like uh like you know, rhythm sections that sort of thing and then string players love sharps though right they do and i hate them for it those ah those bastards in the string section yeah and i grew up like learning to play jazz and jazz ensemble and i would always be given charts with like four or five flats and that's totally easy for me i can deal with a flat and d flat those are good keys this key e major ugh, i don't like that at all but um that said it's still a, like an important thing to like know <laughs> know your emotional reactions to key signatures mm -hmm. and everybody has those yeah the more in touch you are with those the better really the more in touch with your key with center your key emotion a couple more a couple more uh g sharp minor plus augmented augmented maybe that means like a sharp five it looks like an e e major chord to me <laughs> Uh, yeah, it does look like an E major chord. That's just an E major chord in second inversion. Second you got inversion. Fifth, on, fifth on the bottom there. So that's just a second inversion chord. And then finally, you got an E major 9, but there is no E in this final E major 9. And a lot of these chords, you don't have the root of what you say they are, but you're probably just trying to make sense of what you wrote. And that, you know, it's kind of tricky uh, to actually do that with the chord symbols. One other thing aside from the analysis here is, you know, let's say that chord, that second chord is A major 7. Something to keep in mind is when you have the root of the chord in the melody, it, you have to be careful with major 7 chords because if you have an A major 7 chord and you have an A in the melody, you're also going to have a G sharp in there somewhere because that's the major 7. And that's going to either create like a minor ninth or, or a half step. And while that can have a, a cool effect, if that's what you're going for, it can also disguise the melody in, in a way that you may not want. So that's just sort of a, an old school arranging technique. Often what is taught is to make that major seven chord into a six chord, like an A6. Reharmonizing in this way is actually kind of cool, like where, you're, where you don't actually know that much about you know, specific chord symbols, it, it opens you up to actually using your ears. Which, which is a really oh, good gosh. thing when you're making music. Using when, your ears. I know, it's, it's a really outlandish concept. <laughs> but what happens a lot with people that know a lot of theory or they study theory and they want to make use of it is, you know, again, that disconnect, that disconnection that I was talking about before. If you're thinking so much about the analysis and the chord symbols and the theory, uh, if you're not careful, you, start, you stop actually listening to what's happening. So just going by your ear can be a really effective way to, to come up with some new chords. Yeah, I would, I would kind of analyze your left hand voicings, not through chord symbols, but just, um, there's a term called pandiatonicism, which means that you can just basically take whatever notes from the key and arrange them however you want, and they probably are going to sound all right. So that's kind of what you've done here, and honestly, that's, that's really enough. That's uh, certainly enough for creating a Nice reharmonization of thy lick. Thy lick. <laughs> cool. All right, I think that's enough of thy lick uh, yes. for right now. For now. For now. We might. We not might, forever. That's not, for sure. Oh, definitely not. <clears throat> the next one is going to be from Pietari. He is Finnish, uh, or at least he has done a Finnish reharmonization. A <laughs> Finnish reharmonization. I'm uh, sorry. A harmonization of the Finnish version of the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Let's check that out. This exercise is great to take uh, a nursery rhyme and do a reharmonization of it. If you guys were on Instagram a few months ago, there was like the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star Challenge. Oh yeah, uh, same kind of thing. And you hear a lot of different renditions of a very simple melody, and it gives you an opportunity to take something that has a simple melody, has simple harmony, and then you can play with it in however however way you want. Uh, one thing that you know, this is a personal opinion again, but. Something about it sounds a little Christmas song to me. I don't, I don't know if anybody else picked up on that. Yeah, I think whenever you have a lot of, uh, I don't know, what's the best way of saying it? There's 
there is a D minor seven flat five in there, which is, as we all know, it's the most Christmassy That's of all. the Christmas chord. That's the Christmas chord. I think also it's just like, it's a very um, functional reharmonization. There's a very clear key relationships between everything, D minor, G, C, F. Maybe it's the guitar sound, I don't know. Like, it sounds like the, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's that. <laughs> There's something like pleasantly cheesy about it, which I like because it's funny of the music that I write is really cheesy. It's and very pleasantly cheesy. Yeah. I enjoy this. It's a like lot. The, the, the 80s keyboard on top oh. with the Tynes sound. But like just enough of a variation that it doesn't become grating. Like, yeah, yeah, it's still cool. Like, it's, yeah. it's like. Yeah, it's like I, cool cheesy. I think that uh, one thing we could talk about a little bit is your analysis of what you did. Mm. Um, and that's something, you know, there's a bunch of different ways of writing analysis, writing Roman numeral analysis. You call this C9 over F sharp, the 5-7 over flat 2 relative to F. I would call this in, in Berkeley speak, and this is how Berkeley would analyze it, you would call this the sub 5-7 of 4. C9 over F sharp is a voicing for an F sharp 7 with a bunch, bunch of tensions on it, the flat 5, what else is on there? The uh, the flat nine. flat 9. Yeah. Um, so that's personally what I would analyze that as, because uh, that's what it's it's functioning as. It's functioning as the substitute dominant for F. You even call it 5-7 over flat 2. For more on substitute dominance, check out Tritone Substitution. I think the, the main issue, and we, we kind of get a hint of this later on with that uh, Two, with the D add two over F sharp, where you analyze that as two slash sharp four. And I think the, the core issue is, how do you analyze a chord that's a slash chord? Yeah. Do you analyze both halves of the slash or do you do something different? So Adam, how would you analyze D add two over F sharp? I would call that a five of five, honestly. Meaning it's the, uh, the D add two is functioning as the dominant chord of the five chord. It's tonicizing the five chord. And it's over, if you wanted to analyze it further than that, it's over its third. So the five of five over three. So I guess that's like five slash five slash uh, three. The Arabic, like Arabic yeah, the three, yeah. three. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a mouthful. To say something that's fairly simple, and you know, that's one of the important things with analysis is not to get too far in the weeds because it's kind of a simple idea. You're taking a D chord over its, you know, in first inversion and you're moving it to a G chord. Um, but it starts getting like pretty complicated once you start like throwing in all the Roman numerals. Like, you know. yeah. Well, what we're getting at here is once the function is communicated, that's that's all you need for an analysis. Unless yeah. you're trying to uh, give an analysis that is also going to inform an, inst an instrumentalist how to play the chord in a certain way. Like with figured bass, you know, you have the the function, but you also have the inversion spelled out, and that was used to tell the organist how to actually voice that chord. Uh, so it, it depends, again, how deep do you want to go with it. But in terms of functionality, you don't really need to, to put that three underneath. Yeah. I mean, honestly, musically, I don't think we have anything else to say about this because this is this was fun. It's rad. So our final submission comes from Tom Atterd, and he has submitted a funk composition entitled Heist. <laughs> First of all, I really like the video production right off the bat. I know we're talking about music here, but there's this is a great video. It's it's really cool. It's well uh, oriented on the screen. I like the color grading. I like the title up front. It feels like a like a real music video. Production quality definitely goes a long way. So off to a good start. Let's uh, listen to more. <laughs> this G natural, I would question. Uh, it sounds cool. There's like kind of this back and forth between the Moog and the electric guitar, but this G natural and this descending line clashes with the G flat of the keyboards. So you get a, a nice spicy F G flat in the keyboards, then a G natural in the Moog and the electric guitar, and then also an A flat. So you get like a quadruple like cluster between everything. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm curious about it. If you want to lean into that sort of dissonance a little bit more later on, that would be fantastic. But so far, I don't think that's the vibe that you're going for. Yeah, I think it, it actually detracts a little bit from the vibe because yeah. the the effect that I think you're you're intending here is to add some something to fill the space, which is good. I think that that's appropriate. It's sort of a, a little bit of a counterline to the melody. 
Uh, so it, it is filling the space, but it's also drawing your ear too much to that element and not keeping you focused or the listener focused on the actual melody. I agree. Um, let's uh, check out some more. Nice harmony here. Melody works really well too. I think a little bit of variation in that melody line uh, could could add a lot. It doesn't need to be any more than maybe one note difference on one of those repetitions. Yeah. But it's just like one too many times we've we've heard that four note phrase. It, it doesn't have to be a big change at all. Just yeah. the tiniest repetition can go or a variation can go a real really long way. And also I, I would question the dropping out of the electric guitar. For some reason you have this nice texture between flute, moog, and electric guitar and then all of a sudden no electric guitar anymore. It doesn't seem like there's a real need to drop the electric guitar out. It almost sounds like they just forgot to play the melody that they were supposed to be playing. So just consider that. Let's uh, listen to more. Something that can help when you're transitioning from an almost rubato section to one that is a real substantial groove is for everyone in the band to be hearing that groove before it actually hits. And then you're going to have a much easier time locking in because it takes four, about three or four, maybe five measures before people are really locked into the same pulse, the same grid. So if, uh, if you're able to somehow, and this, this might just go with an you know, experience and rehearsing the tune, uh, you know, ad nauseum to the point where you're all very certain about what that tempo is. And then once you actually go to that groove, make it a priority to lock in. Like we're, everybody's looking at the, the notes and playing the chords, but if everybody's also taking a big part of their musical brain to focus on, okay, am I locked in? Then that intention will just get you locked in quicker and that'll help a lot. Yeah, I also think that for this uh, like piano groove, exaggerating the difference between the accented notes and the non-accented notes will really lock that in. Bah, 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 bah. Just it'll, like, it'll also make it more interesting to listen to. Yeah, for sure. Let's listen more. performance, it can really help to exaggerate the short notes, exaggerate the long notes. So you have a real contrast between those two. That's going to make the whole thing just feel funkier. Because right now, the, the short notes don't have as much bite as they could. It doesn't pack as much punch as it could. It's sort of like a, a dead fish hand, handshake. You know the dead fish handshake? No. I, oh, oh, really? like, like oh, 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 that, was, that felt bad. That felt <laughs> not, not quite as bad in this, in this music, but it could certainly be a firmer handshake from a musical handshake. You want, you never you want put this. this. You want this. Yes. I also think that that counterline in the uh, the tenor, it almost feels like it should should be in a uh, on a berry sax. Like down an octave. Oh, that could be cool. Yeah. That, that would be pretty cool. I mean, as it is, it's kind of almost like an imitation of a berry sax. So just an idea. Next time, hire a berry sax player. <laughs> or again, if you want to get as close to that as possible, just you got to pack that punch. Yeah, for and sure. Articulation sure. and a tightness and a real exaggeration of the shortness of those staccato notes will help a lot. Yeah, um, I definitely agree there. All right, let's uh, listen to your your grand Moog solo. Mm. It's it's Moog, right? Not yeah, Moog. Moog. Bob Moog. Moog. Okay, I just want to make sure because they're gonna make fun of me otherwise. <laughs> You. It's kind of interesting that you wrote out the solo. I mean, most of the time in the style, you're going to actually improvise it, even if you know you have a general idea of it. I would try and maybe 
stray away from the straight pentatonic idea because a lot of this piece of music is very pentatonic so far. You do have this nice chromatic line halfway through, but maybe even just throwing in throwing in a, a natural two from the key here or there will will definitely add another color. And I think it's by this point it's fairly needed in the mm -hmm. in the piece. comment to what I said before, the, the performance of this could be enhanced with more emphasis on the, the phrasing, the, the, the short notes, the, the tightness of it. Right now it, it sounds a little bit like, you know, your, your horn's buried in the music, you're very focused on, on the reading. There's a really, there's something to be said for memorizing the music, um, even just a section of it, to get your ears to open up a little bit more. You can focus more, focus more on the actual phrasing versus the notes themselves. This can be a very helpful way to, to approach uh, improving the, the performance. I mean, this is good. You're playing all the rhythms right. You're playing all the notes right. And there is some life to it, but uh, you know, we're trying to take this to the next level, right? So that's going to be instead of just there's a difference there. It's subtle, but it does make a difference, especially when you're trying to get from that sort of 95% of the way there to 100, which is like the hardest 5% to do. I think the harmonic choices in this section need work. You start every phrase with B flat minor and you end every phrase with B flat minor, which is the exact same sort of loop that you did in the previous section. So maybe sort of change it up a little bit, try and figure out a different way of attacking the harmonic rhythm, attacking the harmonic content, come up with something that creates a little bit more contrast here. I do like the fact that the drums like drop out with the uh, no snare, but I think the drums could drop out even more, like maybe just washy cymbals or something, just to create a little bit more contrast between this bridge section and the thing that we've been hearing. The other thing that I think could really add some oomph going into the next section is adding a phrase extension at the end of this bridge. Basically, you have this like swell at the end of it to create even more tension and more forward momentum. Maybe add an extra bar so it's a, like a nine bar phrase. That's a really powerful tool, like a compositional tool that really Brid bridges you from the bridge back into the main section. Mm -hmm. um, let's keep listening. where I start to get tired of that keyboard part a little bit. I mean, yes, it is conveying the harmony, but those are the same voicings we've heard for this whole section, for this whole tune, I think, um, or for a lot of it. So if something can be switched up there, that's going to really help that subtle shift in feel from one section to the next. Uh, this, this repetition is, this is the sort of repetition where it just, it's, it's gone too far and we're not trying to convey a, a minimalist approach anymore. It's just, uh, we just need it. We need something different. So, so just change up the voicings a little bit. I think that'll make a big difference. And maybe even the rhythm. I mean, I know you're you're holding down that groove, but there could be uh, a little shift here and there. This kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about something or other. But the smallest variation goes a long way. We're starting to get into a little bit of a fatigue here in the guitar part too, and the bass part. The bass part, like we haven't there hasn't been a feeling like we've broken out yet. I feel like we haven't broken out in song. I mean, in the horn parts you have, because you have everybody in a big, powerful unison, but the rest, the rhythm section is very kind of tight and contained, and you don't feel... If I was a rhythm section player, I would instinctually start playing more notes by this point to like really make it seem like this is the moment of arrival. This is the, the act three of the hero's journey to bring yeah, it back around. that release, that release. Because <laughs> what repetition does do is it builds tension. Yeah. And tension is such an important part of, of making music. Uh, but if you never have a release of that tension, it's like the boy who cried wolf. You, you just, you don't have that payoff. So at a certain point, we need the payoff, and that's got to open up into something else. And then it's like that feeling of the tension being released is is really powerful. And and that's what I think we could use at this point for sure. Yeah, and you notice that we're not saying make it more complicated. Definitely I mean, not. Uh, when I say more notes, I mean just a, a changing it to a different sort of more driving thing. Even just eighth notes, don 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 don, in the bass will add a lot 
to your performance. Also, maybe having the drummer switch to a ride cymbal at a certain point, at a, a big moment, because the drummer's been on a, a pretty serious hi-hat kick this entire time, and just shifting to a ride cymbal will completely change how everything feels. So I think just paying a little bit more close attention to the rhythm section and how all those parts come together, I think will really kind of make this piece what it can be, because it's almost there. It's like 95% there, but I think there's a few tweaks you need to have uh, in just the parts themselves that will basically take it to the next level. Yeah, uh, let's keep listening. This, this definitely needs uh, drums on the ride cymbal. Like we're we're here. We're we've arrived. We need to we need to break out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um. So I want to say something about the outro here because we have been talking a lot about performance, but the composition at, at this point. I do feel like that just comes, it's a bit abrupt. I don't know how you feel, but. Yeah, it's a little abrupt. Um, I, I don't have too much of a problem with its ending, honestly. I think I like the texture here. I think you should just copy and paste this texture to the actual bridge because mm. there's something about it that feels a little bit fuller, like with these, these like spread voicings or whatever these are and like all the horns, instead of like the syncopated line that you have in the bridge, which was kind of played not super funkily. If you just have these like funkily. nice, funkily, yeah. Mm. If you have these like, uh, spread chords in the bridge instead of the funky syncopated line, which you've been hearing the entire time. I think that creates more contrast. And so I kind of like this ending as the bridge, if that makes any sense. Well, what, yeah. what might work is if you, if you echoed, I guess the ending would be the echo of what you put in the bridge, but if you brought this, this more, um, Corral kind yeah, of yeah, this corral approach earlier, then I think the ending would feel less abrupt because there would be some sort of relationship between what happened earlier in the piece to what's happening at the end. Yeah, and I know it's the same chords that you're using, but texturally it's very different, and we perceive texture a lot more than harmony. Mm. That's kind of like a thing that I've learned a lot just over the past couple of years is that harmony is cool, harmony is awesome, but just as human beings, we perceive textures a lot more like presently in the music. Especially non-musicians. They're going to interpret it's, that a lot more so than the chord changes. Yeah, you're like, oh yes, oh, that's a D flat 6 9. Congratulations. What I'm hearing is a flute. And that's, you know, just on a more primal level, that's usually what we interpret. And so those are the things that you really should be thinking about as you're composing. Not necessarily the chord changes, and you know, I do enjoy me a good chord change, but texture is really, really important in this. And I, I think you could, um, you could think about that moving forward and like, future compositions of yours. I really dig this uh, this performance though. This is really great. I yeah, it's that. super cool. I mean, we're uh, we're really just trying to help get from that like 95 to 100%, but you know, Tom, you got to that 95% and more. So, you know, yeah. great job. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your submission. Thank you for everybody who has submitted. Um, I'm very sorry that I can't get to everybody because there are hundreds and hundreds of submissions. So maybe if you've submitted something, I'll include you in a future video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Jeff, for Thanks, being Adam. my being my uh, wingman in this uh, endeavor. Is that the right word, wingman? Happy to fly with you, Hi, Adam. Happy to fly with you too. Oh, oh. terrorists! <laughs> Cut before that. If you would like to submit something for a future episode of How to Not Suck at Music, please send all submissions to How to Not Suck at Music at gmail.com. Submissions one minute or less with a video element as well as audio element will be heavily prioritized. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, everybody. Peace.